foreign turmoil marks the first day of 2018. Protests in Iran turned deadly. The Obama approach of uh, relieving sanctions, hoping the regime would moderate, has failed. Is now the time for President Trump to take drastic action with Tehran. And North Korea's leader claims he's got a nuclear button while also offering an olive branch? Is American pressure paying off or not? We'll have full coverage, including analysis from Congressman Chris Stewart of the House Intelligence Committee. Meanwhile, from the New York Times, Clinton backers reportedly put up hundreds of thousands of dollars before election. Day in connection with efforts to drum up allegations of sexual harassment against then candidate Donald Trump. We'll debate the ramifications of the bombshell report and. I think it may very well violate the due process and equal protection laws. Blue state governors call the GOP's tax overhaul illegal. When night court convenes, is the new tax law taking effect today actually, as some on the left claim, unconstitutional? Welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. New tonight on those deadly protests shaking Iran, which have also captured the attention of President Donald Trump as he returns to Washington tonight. In a Fox News exclusive, a leaked memo from inside Iran, translated from Farsi to English, appears to show panic at the highest levels of the Iranian government. The report was leaked to Fox News a short while ago, purports to show how Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei is responding to the growing threat to the terrorist regime's power. In key passages from this report, government leaders are quoted as saying, God help us, this is a very complex situation and is different from previous occasions. While protesters are said to be chanting death to the dictator and the leader lives like God while the people live like beggars. President Trump's been monitoring the situation closely and national security correspondent Jennifer Griffin is following the Trump administration's response from the Pentagon. Good evening, Jennifer. Shannon, the death toll in Iran rose to 13 today amidst reports that a protester with a hunting rifle killed a policeman and wounded three others during a protest 200 miles south of Tehran. The violent protests have spread to more than half a dozen cities and started as a result of poultry and egg prices rising 40 percent last week. For the fifth straight day, protesters have taken to cities across Iran, calling for the Iranian regime to meet their economic needs. In a sign of how unprecedented these protests are, they shouted for the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei, the nation's top Islamic cleric and protector of the 1979 revolution, to step down. From Florida, President Trump encouraged the Iranian people. Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for change. The vice president also weighed in. As long as at real Donald Trump is POTUS and I am VP, the United States of America will not repeat the shameful mistake of our past when others stood by and ignored the heroic resistance of the Iranian people as they fought against their brutal regime. So the prime them. minister of Israel sent they encouragement as well. And when this regime finally falls, and one day it will, Iranians and Israelis will be great friends once again. I wish the Iranian people success in their noble quest for freedom. President Obama's national security advisor, Susan Rice, scoffed at the Trump administration's approach. How can Trump help Iran's protesters? Be quiet. In 2009, the Obama administration initially chose to say nothing, so the regime could not blame the protests on outside interference from the U.S. That was the Obama approach. If I were Trump, I'd do the exact opposite of Obama. Obama said, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to mess up the chance of getting a deal with Iran. Well, the deal with Iran hasn't worked. The money didn't go to benefit the people. It went to benefit the Ayatollah and his henchmen. It's not enough to watch. President Trump is tweeting uh, very sympathetically to the Iranian people. 
but you just can't tweet here. You have to lay out a plan. We do not want to make the same mistake that America made uh, before in 1956, calling opposition out in Hungary and standing by watching while Soviet tanks crushed the opposition. Iran's president finally acknowledged the protesters in a New Year's Eve address and hinted at a crackdown. The government will definitely not tolerate those groups who are after the destruction of public properties or disrupting the public order or sparking riots in the society. Some armed protesters have tried to take over police stations and military bases, but were turned back by the security forces. Iran's Revolutionary Guard has so far stayed on the sidelines, but Iranian leaders have hinted they may be losing patience with the protests, the largest since the so-called Green Revolution in 2009. Shannon? Jennifer Griffin from the Pentagon, thank you. President Trump arriving back at the White House via Marine One a short while ago. From foreign threats to tackling immigration issues and new pressure for the FBI and DOJ over the so-called Trump dossier, it's going to be a very busy start to 2018 when all of Washington gets back to work. Here to help make sense of it all, Kelly Jane Torrance, the deputy managing editor for the Weekly Standard. Great to have you with Great us to today. Great to be here. Happy New Year. You too. Okay, so let's start with, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Iran situation later on, but the president also today calling out uh, Pakistan, saying this, the United States has foolishly given Pakistan more than $33 billion in aid over the last 15 years, and they have given us nothing but lies and deceit thinking of our leaders as fools. They give safe haven to the terrorists we hunt in Afghanistan with little help, no more. Now there's talk of blocking uh, an aid package to them to the tune of about a quarter of a billion dollars. Uh, that's one way to start 2018. It is, and I have to say, I I think it's a great start to Trump's Twitter uh, feed in 2018 that he is, instead of attacking the American news media, say, he's actually going after countries and leaders like Iran and Pakistan that are state sponsors of terror or that offer protection to terrorists, which, as Trump points out rightfully, Pakistan has done. And there have been questions for years about how much the, the Pakistani government knew about where Osama bin Laden was. Was and and you know you see terrorist groups constantly crossing the border from Afghanistan into Pakistan and back with seemingly no consequences. So this is really something. It's about time. And Trump did warn in his uh, you know a speech he gave about Afghanistan last year that he was you know he put Pakistan on warning and they knew this might be coming. And clearly whatever has been going on behind the scenes, any negotiations there have not resulted in anything. And so he's bringing it he's bringing it in public. Yeah, and there's some leaders there who've said there's more to this. We're going to expose the truth and the lies, I think, were the words they said. Yeah. So that debate, uh, that little bit of friction is far from over. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things domestically he's got to deal with, too. Now, DACA, on Wednesday, there'll be a meeting of top congressional Republicans and Democrats with different White House actors and leaders. The president saying there's no way without a wall and some other, uh, you know, possibly ending chain migration and the visa lottery for people coming to this country, we're not going to move forward on DACA. Um, Democrats say they hope they're not at an impasse before they even get to the meeting. Here is what Senator John Thune said. Uh, about where the Democrats are and actually trying to work with Republicans these days. They clearly have a strategy that, uh, you know, runs, uh, try to uh, sort of obstruct at all costs. Uh, they were not willing participants in tax reform. Uh, I hope that they are on some of these issues that we mentioned earlier. But the, the, the fact is, uh, Mike, as we head into this election year, there is a very different philosophy. As you listen to Chuck, Chuck Schumer and other Democrats talk, uh, these are people who believe that the federal government in Washington uh, it knows better how to spend your money than you do. Okay, so do they get something done on immigration or DACA? That's an excellent question, Shannon. And I have trouble seeing it happening. I mean, first of all, you've got the Republican Party itself is split on some of these mm -hmm. issues. You know, you've got the budget hawks who want to cut spending, and then you've got others who want to cut spending but not for the military, and they want more money for the military. So you've already got some splits with the Republican Party, and then add in the Democrats. Now, are the D Democrats willing to sit down? Now, they skipped their last meeting with Trump because they didn't like some right. of his tweets right before. Mm -hmm. They look like they're going to go to this one, but they have proven that they do not want to negotiate with Donald Trump, and I'm not sure politically it's a bad move for them. Now, maybe bad for the country, but politically. I mean, if you look at all of the special elections we've had in the last year, Democrats have done very well because there's a lot of anger about President Trump and some of what he's done. And I think Democrats, they don't want their base to think, hey, now we're working with this guy that all of you dislike. And I think they also don't want to give anything 
to the Republicans or to Donald Trump that looks like a win going into the midterm. So for them, they're they're making more of a political calculation than a policy mm -hmm. calculation on this one. Yeah, and somehow they've got to work out government funding because only a couple weeks from now we're going to be doing that January again. January 19th. Yeah, that's, that's just around the corner. I want to quickly hit on this as well. Uh, Congressman Devin Nunes, who heads the House Intelligence uh, Committee, has now said to the FBI and DOJ, you are not giving us the information that we're seeking. He says this in a letter uh, to the Deputy AG uh, Rosenstein. As a result of the numerous delays and discrepancies that have hampered the process of subpoena compliance, the committee no longer credits the representations made by DOJ and or the FBI regarding these matters. And this is all connected to the Russia probe. He says, we've asked for witnesses, we've asked for scheduling, we've asked for documents. He said, in one case, you told us you didn't even have any of the stuff we asked for, and then we found out later you did. This is sort of a weird intergovernmental, inter intra branch situation. It we is, and I mean that letter. If you you know you read the whole letter, it's it's kind of shocking. He actually says in there, I, I think it's about time for the FBI and DOJ mm -hmm. to start investigating themselves. And I you know anybody who's overseeing these this investigation of the FBI and DOJ, it, they've got a tightrope to walk because they don't want to undermine law enforcement in America, and they don't want to undermine America's mm -hmm. highest institution of law enforcement. You don't want to have Americans thinking they can't trust the FBI to do its job properly, but at the same time, they need to make sure that a very, very sensitive uh, political uh, investigation of top political leaders was done fairly and done right. And we're seeing some things coming out that make it look like, you know, maybe only a few people at the FBI and the DOJ, but enough to have Americans wondering, hey, we're partisan politics behind what should be legal nonpartisan investigations. And so it's a it's a tough tightrope to walk to, to walk. And I think that Devin Nunes is certainly picking one side. And I think even some Republicans are nervous he's going right. a bit too far. But you know, let's let's get some answers. That's yeah. you know, he has a point. If 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 they are asking for information and they're not providing it, you know, yeah, you have to wonder why. Why won't they I mean it's this is the this is Congress. The they they have yeah. the ultimate subpoena power. Well and he's given them a deadline of January third this Wednesday, so we will see. Kelly Jane Torrance, always great to have you. Great Thanks to be here. In. Happy New Year again. You as well. All right, returning now to our top story, Iran. Senator Lindsey Graham says the deadly unrest there is proof that the previous administration's approach failed. Well, it tells us that the Obama approach of uh, relieving sanctions, hoping the regime would moderate, has failed. The people are not getting the benefit of sanctions relief. They're more upset with their oppressors than ever. The money from sanction relief has gone into rebuilding the uh, Iranian military and they're destabilizing the Mideast. For right, reaction to this and more, let's turn to Republican Congressman from Utah, Chris Stewart. Uh, Congressman, thanks for joining us tonight. Good evening, happy new year. And to you as well. What do you make of what we've been seeing playing out in Iran the last few days? Well, I think Senator Graham has it exactly right. I mean, we have an opportunity here to correct one of the great failures of the previous administration, and that is President Obama was so blindly committed, so determined to create this Iranian nuclear agreement that he kowtowed to the mullahs, he kowtowed to the ruling elites, and he entirely forgot about the Iranian people. They know that now. We see the economic impacts that it's had on their lives, and we understand why they're beginning to rise up. <clears throat> this is what the president tweeted today. He says, Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom along with human rights. The wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for change. So Senator Graham did praise the president saying he's been striking the right tone in talking about the Iranian people and in these tweets. But he said, you got to follow that up. There now has to be a plan that is spelled out. Um, there's been talk of the president giving a speech, uh, you know, identifying exactly what steps could be taken to help these folks. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, let's talk about the things that we know don't work. You know, I was surprised to hear when you reported Susan Rice says that president should remain quiet. That's what President Obama did during the Velvet Revolution, and we know what happened there. We, it failed utterly because they felt like the people felt like they had been abandoned by the American people and frankly by the world community. That doesn't work. We know that won't work. Second thing, and I think this is so important to recognize, we've spent or sent billions of dollars to the Iranian leaders as a result of the agreement that we talked about a moment ago, billions of dollars. Now think about this, about 450 million of it was sent to them in cash, literally a plane load of euros and dollars. And why was that? It was because they wanted to have that cash to funnel it to Hezbollah, 
to funnel it to Hamas, to funnel it to the IRGC and other terrorist organizations, that money wasn't going to be going to the Iranian people. They wanted it in cash so they can funnel it, it wouldn't be traced. And again, the Iranian people were promised that the, the sanctions relief would make an economic difference in their lives. It just simply hasn't. The mullahs aren't honest with their own people. They haven't been honest with the American people. And again, we're seeing the result of that. Yeah, and I think if, if I remember correctly, Secretary of then Secretary of State uh, John Kerry said something to the effect that they couldn't, there was no way to guarantee that some of that cash wouldn't flow into these terrorist uh, organizations or bad actors. I want to ask you as well about another foreign policy hotspot, which is North Korea. Um, we have a little bit uh, from uh, Kim Jong Un talking about uh, exactly what kind of threat he had. He says he has a nuclear button now, and he says this about reaching the U.S. The entire U.S. mainland is within the range of our nuclear strike, and the button for the nuclear strike is always on the table in my office. They should clearly know that this is certainly not a threat, but rather a reality. So where do we go with North Korea? Oh my gosh, it's a challenge, isn't it? Now, I don't think that he has a button sitting on his desk with nuclear missiles capable of reaching the U.S. quite yet, but he's very, very close. And the president has made it clear, and I completely agree with him, he will not allow North Korea, he will not allow Kim Jong-un to threaten and to blackmail and to take not one or two U.S. cities, but literally dozens of U.S. cities and destroy them if he were to choose to. He can't allow that to happen. You ask, what do we do? <clears throat> I think the sanctions, and, and it, it has to start with sanctions and with diplomatic efforts. And it was interesting, as we've seen, some of these uh, oil tankers that have been, you know, uh, secretly refueling uh, North Korea. Look, if you think China wasn't aware of that, that you don't understand the Chinese leaders. They're certainly aware. They are, they're aware of everything that happens within their country. They're certainly aware if they had some, uh, some ships that were going out and refueling these uh, North Korean tankers. I think they were testing us. When I say they, I mean in this case the Chinese leaders. Mm -hmm. They have pledged they would enforce these sanctions, but they haven't been honest with us in the past. And again, I think they were testing us to see if we'd hold them accountable. As you know, we've impounded two of those ships now. President Trump has been very clear in the world community saying, calling Chinese leaders out on this, pointing out what they've done. It's important that he does that. But we have to keep the pressure on, and we've got to keep the pressure on the Chinese as well. And also North Korea, and we're going to talk a little bit more coming up about whether a blockade is a possibility there, whether it would work, whether it's effective, um, whether you could even um, pull it off, and who would have to cooperate in order to get that done uh, over there. But in the meantime, uh, Kim Jong-un also <clears throat> said that he's willing to have talks now with South Korea, and they have said essentially some leaders there, the door's always been open. If we thought there was a way that we could work on this, um, we'd be willing to have conversations. Kim Jong-un saying it's, it's time for both sides to ratchet down the military tension. Um, do you think it would be yeah. helpful for those two sides to get together? Can it bring about effective change? Well, I, I, it's obviously something we want to encourage, but we need to do it with our eyes wide open. We, we can't be naive. I was a young Air Force captain flying the B-1 when we were told by then President Clinton, because we were preparing for strikes against North Korea at that time. This is in the mid-90s. And President Clinton held up an agreement says, no, 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 it's not necessary. We've got this agreement. The North Koreans will never have nuclear weapons. And of course, that wasn't true, and we failed in that policy. And they're very, very good about using negotiations in order to stall for time while they continue with the development of their nuclear programs or their missile programs. So as long as we're aware of that and we don't go into this blindly, but again, what we're trying to do is to force him to the table. So let's not take any, if he does present an olive leaf, let's not take that and brush it aside. Let's sincerely try to engage him, but let's do it, as I said, in a mature and showing judgment that recognizes they're not always honest with us. In fact, they're rarely honest with us. We don't want them to delay these negotiations just so he can complete his missile program. Congressman Chris Stewart, thank you very much for weighing in with us on this New Year's uh, Day. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure. All right, remember that report about an L.A. lawyer who tried to line up big payouts for women, accusing then-candidate Donald Trump of sex harassment. Tonight, another report, this time from the New York Times, shedding new light on the alleged scheme. Details breaking just ahead. And later, you may have heard that some politicians from California, New York, and New Jersey, they don't like the $1.5 trillion tax cut plan going into effect today. Well, they may be heading to court. You're going to hear from both sides in night court. Plus, we'll explain why fireworks were especially dear to one Iraqi city this New Year's.
Oakland attorney and her daughter allegedly tried to offer cash to women considering coming forward with sexual harassment claims against then-candidate Donald Trump. According to the New York Times, attorney Lisa Bloom, the daughter of attorney Gloria Allred, worked on raising hundreds of thousands of dollars to encourage alleged sexual misconduct victims of Trump's to tell their stories. Fox News White House correspondent Kevin Cork is here live with more on that story. Hi, Kevin. Hey there, Shannon. It's actually called Pay for Play, and to be completely honest, it's one of the oldest and most popular games right here in Washington. You know the idea. You pay uh, someone a little money or maybe a lot of money to smear a political enemy or to take them down. But in this instance, we're talking about political gamesmanship, Shannon, uh, that could ultimately cost the accused not just their job, in fact, a lot more than that, could end up costing them their very freedom. Now, as you pointed out, the New York Times and other outlets, to be fair, confirm that Democratic political partisans are now exploiting the Me Too movement, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars to support accusers who come forward with charges against their political opponents. Notably, as you also pointed out, lawyer, lawyer Allred, an unabashed supporter of Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Democratic Party now raising money to fund a lawsuit against the president by a woman by the name of Summer Zervos. She says she was assaulted by the then uh, just regular media mogul Donald Trump about a decade ago. Now, obviously, those are accusations that the president strongly denies. Now, all this is happening as Allred's daughter and also a lawyer, Lisa Bloom, admits that she collected hundreds of thousands of dollars from Clinton backers just before the 2016 election in a last-ditch effort to vet and ultimately present another Trump accuser that effort did not pay out now you'll find this interesting a chunk of that money Shannon actually came from a guy by the name of David Brock now you probably remember his name of course Brock uh, a former conservative hatchet man some have called him previously well now he is a strident uh, Hillary Clinton supporter and he's made no secret of the fact that he has a desire to create a fund that would help to pay other accusers to come forward with accusations against Republicans across the spectrum. And, and while the effort, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, to come forward is not limited, Shannon, to just left-wing groups who are out there trying to pay for play. Uh, there are a number of right-wingers who have also done this, including some conservative bloggers. Uh, it does beg the question, uh, does the fact that an accuser uh, is being backed by politically partisan money uh, denigrate their charge? Does it somehow negate the validity of their charge? And maybe an even better question is, should it? Hmm. Shannon? Very good questions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Good mm -hmm. to see you. Mm -hmm. All right, here to discuss those questions brought up by Kevin and more, Beverly Hallberg with the Heritage Foundation and former Missouri Congressman Don Calloway. Great to have you both. Thank Thanks, you. Happy New Thanks, Anne. Happy New Year. Okay, I want to start with uh, Linda Bloom, who is one of the attorneys uh, here that we're talking about. And um, uh, excuse me, Lisa, this is what she has to say in the New York Times. She said it doesn't cost anything to publicly air allegations. Security and relocation are expensive and were sorely needed in a case of this magnitude in a country filled with so much anger, hate, and violence. Beverly, she has said this is about protecting these women if they decided to come forward and I, not paying them to manufacture something. I think in many ways it's damaging to them. If these claims are true, if they're proven true, of course they're extremely concerning. But when you have someone saying, I'll pay you, she even reached out to tabloids saying we can even do some type of interview with them if you want. She was going to get a payout herself to do this. I actually think there is then reason, as you were just reporting, to say, hey, you're getting paid for this. Are these actual allegations um, something that should be pushed against him? And I would say as well, when, when you take a look at the allegations against President Trump, I think it, it also begs the question, why are they having to work so hard to, to find women who want to speak out? There are some that have, but having to pay women, I actually think it hurts their case when they're saying he did something. Well, and that's the thing, is that even if these are legitimate claims, if any of these women, when you have the money, as Kevin said, when money factors in and people have other questions, um, this is from a very prominent attorney, Douglas Wigdor, who is also in this New York Times piece. He says this, if you're getting money from someone who has an ax to grind against the person you're accusing of unlawful activity, that most certainly opens the door to a line of questioning that very well could undermine the veracity of your client's story, Don. It's not good. Uh, I used to practice law as a younger fellow, and this is a bad fact, but it's not a determinative fact by any means. At the end of the day, you have to kind of get past the salacious nature of this whole thing and look to the nature of the claims. Is what they're saying true? Will they have their day in court? And ultimately, is it still something that's provable, yes or no? And in this Me Too moment that has affected all of our professional and public and private lives, the president is not the one person who gets to say, well, they were paid, that's not the case. The New York Times, the Washington Post, whatever political slant they may take, 
is a pretty standard practice, as Kevin reported, to pay witnesses to come forward with various news pieces. Again, this is not a good fact, but it's not a determinative fact by any means. What we should be looking at is whether or not what these women are saying is true. Well, and in so many of these cases, if you're in the middle of an election, as you said, it's so important to have due process and have your day in court. But Beverly, so many times when these are in the middle of um, the campaigns, there's not going to be that time. So it's now just the court of public opinion, and that can have a significant impact on who gets elected and who uh, doesn't. And you were even saying with this, this was about um, Lisa Bloom coming out and saying we wanted to do this prior to the election. So this was also trying to change a trajectory of election, which I do have concerns with. I would say when you're taking a look at accusations, you have to say, can you corroborate the this, this information. Are there multiple people? Are they speaking on their own? This is where the payment gets a little bit tricky because if they are getting paid off, you wonder why they're doing it. So you have to look at multiple people speaking out, figuring out whether or not anybody else can corroborate it because I think that's what it comes down to in figuring out whether or not it's actual proof. Yeah, and Don. Folks have done this on both sides of the aisle. I mean, sure. there are Democrat strategists, Republican strategists, people out there. In the New York Times piece, talks about going back to Paula Jones and beyond that. I right. mean, there have there have been coordinations across the years and across party lines on mm. this kind of thing. There have, and so it's not really a partisan issue. But I would also think, as Kevin reported, there's very practical matters to why you would pay uh, a witness or someone to come forward. First of all, the day that a woman comes forward, her life is no longer hers. She's a public figure, whether or not she asked for it. She's got media camped out, and her name is in front of the world. Uh, perhaps. Perhaps that's something that you have to incentivize someone to do if their claims have any truth. Secondly, if this thing moves towards legal proceedings, as the Blooms and All Reds of the world want it to happen, uh, lawsuits cost money. You have depositions, you have court reporters, all these things that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for that ultimately have to be financed. So again, I realize that the money is not a good fact here for big time Democrats here, but it's kind of unfortunately the reality that we live in, and it doesn't mean that these women do not have serious claims which should be really looked at. Well, I'm really, some of the, the women over the last few weeks that we've heard about these reports with Lisa Bloom ultimately decided not to come forward. Um, they either wanted a lot more money because they thought their lives were never going to be private again, they wanted security and that kind of thing, or for whatever reason they personally decided, decided it wasn't worth a personal cost to them. Yeah, and you have to take that into consideration. There is, as you were just saying, a lot that can happen to women who do come out, their name is out there, what does this mean for their career? But I even want to take a look at, at Lisa Bloom and, and look at some of her past uh, trajectory in these cases. She did defend Harry mm -hmm. Weinstein. There are some concerns about, okay, if you are a, a an attorney who wants to stand up for women's rights, why did you defend Harry Weinstein and why are you now saying we want to go against Trump? It looks political and I think maybe that's why some of the women decided we don't want her to defend us in this. I think even she has kind of backtracked on that saying maybe that wasn't the best decision because, you know, it doesn't, you as an attorney, yeah. you know, we know that you're not always, you know, in sympathico with your client. Listen, but there's no doubt it's political and let's just, let's just put out there that Harvey Weinstein is a terrible guy. Guy, right, <laughs> and uh, I think that's one thing that everybody can agree on uh, in the new year. It's extremely political. That is absolutely the case. But that's kind of the nature of the game that we've all chosen to play. And so, uh, can't deny that it's political. But again, we also can't deny that these women might not have very serious claims mm -hmm. that should that's be considered. True. I mean, both of those things can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. Don and Beverly, great to see you both. Thank, Thank you, Shannon. Happy, Happy New, new year. year. Happy New Year. We're not even going to ask about resolutions and if you've broken them yet. <laughs> all right, we're going to tell you coming up about a very dangerous journey through High Mountain Pass without warm enough clothes, danger at every turn, who these people are, where they're going, and what they're trying to escape from next. And how some Californians brought in the new year on a high at the toke of midnight. January 1st is not just the start of a new year. It is the day hundreds of new state laws kick in all over the country. Here are some interesting ones. In Iowa, voters will be asked to provide an ID. If you don't have one, you can sign an affidavit and cast a provisional ballot. But come 2019, you will need an ID or you will not be able to vote. West Virginia voters will also need an ID from now on. California is implementing a sanctuary state law that will ban law enforcement agencies from using resources to investigate or detain people based on immigration status. Critics say that will limit cooperation between state and local law enforcement and federal immigration agents. Also in California, employers are no longer allowed to ask you about prior salary information or to use it to determine whether or not to offer you a job. 
In Oregon, they've upped the smoking age from 18 to 21 and a couple of new laws in Illinois. One that allows pets to be treated as children instead of property in cases of divorce and for former couples to set up legal custody agreements. The other law there establishes Barack Obama Day on August 4th, his birthday. But it's a commemorative holiday, so you're still going to have to go to school and work. Also in California, as the clock struck midnight, the state became the sixth in the country to legalize recreational marijuana, giving some cannabis users a lawful way to celebrate. Marianne Rafferty has more from Los Angeles. Cannabis consumers ring in the new year on a high, lining up early at dispensaries around the Golden State. The attainment of positivity, something to show some light to where it is not necessarily negative. Only a handful of stores like this one an hour from Los Angeles received a state license to open today. That's because it was left up to local jurisdictions to approve licensing. Larger cities like L.A. and San Francisco are still working out the details, but dispensaries already used to selling medical cannabis are ready to serve the public. It's going to change from uh, dispensing medication and it's like, oh, I hope you feel better to enjoy the high. <laughs> California is the sixth state to legalize recreational pot, but now with added restrictions on sellers. Everything is going to have to be pre-weighed and sealed. And additional costs. I expect a 30 percent increase. Because uh, first of all, we're going to be burdened with heavier taxation and plus we're going to have to hire more staff. Cannabis sales have been legal for four years in Colorado. Supporters say in spite of some early stumbles, government regulation works. We can control it. We know who is producing it and who's selling it. And we know that they're following rules that will protect public health and safety. Not to mention millions in new tax revenue for state and local governments. In California, lawmakers hope to collect $1 billion in 2018 and billions more in years to come. But opponents of legalization say it's not worth it. What we've seen when that use increases is things like the traffic fatalities increasing, um, the use obviously of youth and adults increasing. Um, we also look at things like ERs and hospitalizations and homelessness and a whole other realm of things um, that are unintended consequences. What happens in California is yet to be seen. The new law says you must be at least 21 to buy. You can't smoke in public and road signs along many California highways remind drivers that driving while high is still DUI. Shannon. Marianne, thank you very much. We're in the world now in about 90 seconds. We begin in Iraq and a scene the likes of which has not been experienced there in far too long. Check it out. The northern Iraqi city of Mosul enjoying fireworks at the stroke of midnight last night. And it's a big deal because Mosul was just recently liberated from ISIS. It was the first New Year celebration in four years. Christians also held Christmas mass in the area, a significant development because, as you know, ISIS tried to drive Christians out completely out of the so-called caliphate during those four years of war. All right, while these adventurers are braving a new land and crossing cold and unfamiliar mountains, this is not a scene from the next installment of The Lord of the Rings. Middle Eastern migrants are now trying to cross the border between Italy and France by passing undetected through high mountain passes in the Alps. Poorly equipped for the rugged terrain, they hope to reach shelters before freezing to death or getting caught by French police. To Africa now and an alcoholic beverage factory in Cameroon catching on fire. The blaze spreading to nearby homes and a school very difficult to control because of the heat and all that alcoholic fuel. People tried to salvage some of the booze before it burned, but most of it was lost. At least eight people died when a fast ferry capsized off Indonesia's part of Borneo Island. Rescue efforts are underway and several other passengers are believed to be missing. Boat accidents are common there in that area, according to experts, because of poorly enforced safety regulations. Well, night court will be in session in just a moment. We'll take you to New York, where Governor Andrew Cuomo was threatening to take the newly passed tax plan to court. But first, South Korean authorities seize a second ship accused of importing oil into North Korea as the rogue nation delivers a menacing New Year's message to the U.S. I'm proud of what we did last year, and I saw what our respected leader Kim Jong-un said in his New Year's address, and it made me determined to work harder. South Korean authorities have seized a second ship they suspect of violating international sanctions by supplying oil to North Korea. 
Recently, tough U.N. sanctions were imposed, banning nearly all of North Korea's oil imports in an attempt to curb ballistic missile tests. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has called on all nations to clamp down on the rogue regime, saying the U.S. has a right to, quote, interdict maritime traffic. But should the U.S. lead an actual blockade of North Korea? Some experts are saying that is a solution to bringing Pyongyang to heel as it displays a new so-called nuclear button and yet another threat. Joining me now to discuss former Green Beret and Fox News contributor Michael Wall. It's great to see you tonight. Thanks, Shannon. Okay, so I want to start by a piece that was an opinion piece on foxnews.com uh, from a retired lieutenant commander from the Navy, Gregory Keeley. He says this, mm -hmm. short of a naval blockade where every ship in the vicinity of North Korea is boarded, searched, and if necessary, impounded, it will be impossible to entirely close the oil lifeline spigot. Is, is it a realistic solution to this issue? Well, big picture, you know, President Trump must consider, and this is an important part of it, every option on the table short of the military option because so much is at stake there. So what would a blockade, a naval blockade, seek to accomplish? Well, basically two things. One, to stop the inflow coming into North Korea of oil and gas and anything that could benefit its nuclear program, the machinery or any raw materials. And then the export, in particular with North Korea, of its textiles and seafood where it gets a lot of hard currency. But Operationally, it would be incredibly tough. It would, it would seriously um, tie down our Pacific Fleet, specifically the seventh fleet based out of Japan, and it's the seventh fleet that already lost two ships this year, uh, the McCain and the Fitzgerald, to those collisions that we remember talking about. So I'm not, you know, it would have to be part of an overall strategy. Uh, I still would like to see us absolutely focused on China and choking off uh, and, and encouraging the Chinese to choke everything off the North Koreans. Remember, they still have a very long uh, land border with North Korea. They have an oil pipeline. And what we'd risk with a blockade is that we tie down our Pacific fleet while the Chinese are still supplying the North Koreans because to them, it's more of our problem than it is a Chinese mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, they've got to be made to feel like it is in their best interest to act in a way that is negative, has a negative impact on North Korea. By the way, um, North Korea, its state media outlet said this about the possibility of a naval blockade. They said, should the U.S. and its followers yeah. try to enforce the naval blockade against our country, we will see it as an act of war and respond with merciless self-defense countermeasures, as we have warned repeatedly. That, that sounds pretty much uh, like the response we get to them from just about everything we do. Yeah, well, that's right. And, but in this case, a blockade is considered, you know, historically an act of war uh, by most countries. You know, the other piece here, though, is an authorities issue. We would need a UN sanction specifically authorizing the use of force. Right now, what the UN authorizes is an inspection regime, and that's fine. And we're starting to do that. We're certainly seeing the South Koreans do that. But if a ship doesn't comply, we are not authorized um, to actually use force to get it to comply. So we would we would have to go back to the UN for for additional authorities. And again, you know what we would risk. I, at the end of the day, I think if a, I would like to see us try a blockade before we go to the final military mm -hmm. option, but we do risk also a slow escalation at sea, and we could risk losing um, you know the the uh, benefit of surprise by a precision strike on the nuclear program and on the leadership. Mm -hmm. So a lot for the president to consider here. Yeah, and you talked about China. We know Russia is also a factor here as well. Uh, how, oh, absolutely. How do uh, those who believe uh, North Korea is a threat to them, how do they convince China and Russia it's in their best interest to get involved in, in a well, more substantive way? Well, what I think at the end of the day we have to do is make the Chinese, in particular, the Russians to a lesser degree, start feeling the pain and making this part of their problem. How does how would we do that? Well, one, we can authorize and work with uh, the Japanese to go offensive. Their constitution right now prevents that in terms of their in terms of their military. Reintroducing tactical nuclear weapons into South Korea, which we had up into the 1990s, and a number of other things in terms of introducing more advanced missile defense and more advanced radars to, to the point where the Chinese see the security dynamic drastically shifting against them in Asia and they say, you know what, North Korea, you're more of a problem than you're worth and we're finally going to take uh, drastic action here. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, every day a new twist in this. Uh, Michael Walls, thank yeah. you so much for helping us break it down. Good to see you. Okay, thanks, Shannon. Happy New Year. You too.
All right, some governors say they are ready to launch a legal battle over the GOP's tax overhaul. The argument is that the tax cuts are unconstitutional. Well, our legal eagles are here. They're on the case when night court is in session. Next. We shall now convene tonight's edition of Night Court. The newly passed Republican tax overhaul goes into effect today, most of it, but some blue state governors like New York's Andrew Cuomo say the new tax code may actually be illegal because it places a $10,000 cap on state and local property tax deductions. We're doing the legal research now to see if there is a legal challenge. Uh, I think it may very well violate the due process and equal protection laws. Uh, it is the most egregious uh, political act I have seen. Uh, not since the Civil War have you seen the states this divided. Cuomo argues the tax cuts are unconstitutional because they violate the Fifth Amendment, known most for its protection against self-incrimination. But that amendment also protects individuals against seizure of life, property, or liberty without due process. Cuomo, along with California Governor Jerry Brown and New Jersey Governor-elect Phil Murphy, say they are exploring legal challenges to those caps. So let's bring in our legal eagles, criminal defense attorney Vinu Varghese, who is arguing on behalf of the Democratic governors, and former federal prosecutor Doug Burns, who's arguing the tax law is constitutional. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bring. All right, Doug, I want to start with you. Uh, sure. This is what uh, political Democratic political consultant Phil Singer says. It's a no-brainer for them to do this. Failing to aggressively pursue a remedy would be political malpractice. Sounds like there he's thinking of not only the potential legal win for them, but really the PR or political battle in taking this on, and that being a potential win. Well, that's a perfect place to start because it's way more political, of course, than it is legal. Obviously, New York State is a very high tax state, and so to cap uh, the deduction for state and local and real estate taxes at $10,000 does harm people whose taxes are above that measure. But legally, the claim that it's unconstitutional based on equal protection grounds is incredibly weak. Maybe they want to hit the books a little harder and come up with some other avenue. But think about it, Shannon. You have distinctions in the Internal Revenue Code all over the place. Single filing is different than married, okay? If you earn X dollars more than the other person, your taxes are higher. That's what the tax code is. So to say that this distinguishes unconstitutionally against someone whose taxes are higher than 10,000, incredibly weak argument, in my right. view. Well, and you're not the only one who thinks that because uh, David Gamage, who is a professor of tax law at Indiana University's School of Law, says this, I don't understand how they think they have a valid lawsuit here. Venu? Yeah. Well, the argument that Governor Cuomo should be making is that this is double taxation. See, when you pay your federal income tax, when you pay taxes to the federal government, when you have a tax liability, the way the income tax was created during the Civil War was that you take care of your state and your local property taxes first before you pay anything to the federal government. So that's the, uh, that's the premise that Governor Cuomo should start with. And then, from a PR perspective, we talked about PR, <clears throat> the Democrats can now make the argument that they're the party for states' rights. They're the party of limited government because by eliminating this deduction, the SALT deduction, the, uh, this deduction, by eliminating or reducing it to $10,000, what's happening is that more money is being given to the federal government. And you can make the argument that it's bloating the federal government. Well, that's not an argument that I hear Democrats make a lot, Doug, <laughs> as well, far as too much money going to the federal government and that it's a bloated mess here. I mean, both parties have been, uh, you know, not yeah. too uh, ambitious about cutting spending uh, when it comes down to it. But, you know, what do you make of that potential argument? Well, I like the way my colleague obviously raises another avenue, which is double taxation, as opposed to that very, very weak equal protection argument. Uh, but the reality is, I even think the double taxation is a little weak, most respectfully, and here's why. Because you could say taxing Social Security, taxing Medicare, and income tax, those are triple taxation on your same earnings. So I think it's a tough argument. There was a case out of Maryland, mm -hmm. but it said, look, if I'm in Maryland and I earn money in Colorado and Colorado taxes me, don't tax me on the same earnings in Maryland. But that's a little different than here. Yeah, because there we get into the Commerce Clause, and I don't want to make us all right. glaze over and go back to law school, but it in wouldn't, weeds, it wouldn't right? apply yeah. in, the, in the federal case. I'm going to yeah. have flashbacks but, of the bar exam. But yes, Vinu, go ahead. 
But what I'm saying, actually, I think, Doug, you've raised the, the, the case, but that's actually the case that I think right. there will work in the favor of the Democrats if they push this. Right. You had a conservative court with Justice Alito leading the way, saying that taxation, when a Maryland resident was making money and being taxed outside the state, they couldn't get a deduction for that in-state. This is the same kind of argument that the Democrats should be making or may ultimately make here. And look, you don't know where it's going to go, but I think what's going to happen is you're going to have these governors, whether it's Governor Brown, Governor, uh, Governor-elect Governor Murphy, or Governor Cuomo, file for a stay, and then it's going to get up to the Supreme Court. And, you know, like nobody ever expected Chief Justice Roberts to save Obamacare. So yeah. you just don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems that that seems to be um, the left's protocol with just about anything that President Trump is able to get done. So much of it is tied up from the travel yeah. ban to all kinds of things in legal uh, battles, most of them filed in the Ninth Circuit, um, <laughs> where it makes it really tough for him to get anything yeah. done. But, Vinu, I want to ask you what you make of the yeah. argument that a lot of people respond and just say, you should put pressure on your state and local leaders to lower those taxes and maybe not expect people to pay for all kinds of programs and do things. Maybe you should cut spending at the state level if you're so worried about how high the taxes are there. You know, the way that the states work, particularly New York, uh, New Jersey, California, is that there's a level of services that people expect. So, you know, I, I recently was having this conversation with a, with a friend of mine who went to high school. He's an NYPD captain, and he is a staunch Republican, and he is angry because he says, look, you know, cops, that this bill is going to kill cops, it's going to kill the civil servant because they entered into a contract with the government to buy homes. Why was it important to buy homes? Because property taxes pay for schools. So the cop whose only deduction is that of the mortgage tax deduction is now being limited is basically this captain friend of mine was saying it's killing him. Yeah, and there, this is a big Republican guy. Who's yeah, there's a lot to dig through, and as we see the reality of it play out, um, you know, Republicans remain convinced that it's going to be good, and folks, once they get it, will appreciate it, and when they see the difference in their uh, paycheck, so we'll see. But Doug and Vinu, great to have you both with us tonight. Um, Thank we'll you, let Zane. folks at home decide what they think about your arguments. Thank Thanks you, for being with us. Yeah, sure. tweet me at Shannon Bream if you want to roll in on Night Court and tell us what you think. All right, every year, just about everywhere, some hardy folks take the plunge in the heart of winter. But this winter is not like most, most others, and that has the tradition of polar bear plunges in deep trouble. We'll explain next. This is not for the faint of heart. Earlier today, a thousand swimmers ringing in the new year part uh, in the annual Coney Island Polar Bear Plunge for Charity. Last year, swimmers enjoyed 50 degree weather. This year, uh, made it up to about 17 degrees by early afternoon. Rescuers reportedly hauled off one swimmer on a stretcher as he complained about freezing feet and toes. Other states canceled them altogether. We'll see you tomorrow.